All right, so this is then how the Buddha recommends that we uh, look at his teachings. I've just said, said a few things, but the, of course, this is the main, uh, the main thing that comes straight from the Buddha himself. Uh, yeah, so, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, the teaching is well explained by the Buddha. And I think, Svakato uh, Dhamma, ba Dhamma Bhagavato, uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and um, uh, Svakato Bhagavata Dhammo. So, again, remember the idea of well proclaimed, as I mentioned yesterday, is the idea that this Dhamma is really well thought out. And the Buddha says nothing superfluous and nothing is missing here. And I think that is a very important point. Nothing is superfluous. You can't take anything out. You can't say rebirth is some kind of ancient cultural idea that existed in India, but nothing to do with the modern world. If you say that, you are losing a core aspect of the Dhamma. The idea of Dhamma without rebirth is a bit like a house of cards without the bottom card. Yeah, house of cards without the bottom card. You get the idea. Yeah, it is not. It's not a house of cards. Uh, yeah, it kind of the house of card collapses, uh, and so there is no house of cards without the bottom card. There is no dhamma without rebirth. Uh, it is fundamental to these teachings, uh, and uh, so we can't just take things out. Uh, and uh, we know one of the things that uh, again one of the points about having faith in the Buddha. When the Buddha says there is rebirth, uh, the Buddha says he has discovered this. This is part of his insight into the nature of reality. When we say that uh, rebirth is a cultural thing, in other words, it's something that arises in certain cultures, uh, yeah, then uh, actually, no, it is not in Buddhism, it's not a cultural thing at all. It comes from the Buddhist insight. That is not a cultural thing. That is a thing that relates to reality. Uh, the cultural thing is the lack of appreciation of rebirth in modern societies. That is the cultural thing. Uh, yeah, because that arises, like in you know, particularly kind of modern Western society, the idea that there is no rebirth arises out of a particular philosophy, a particular culture, which has rejected all of these things. It is the lack of understanding rebirth, which is a cultural thing. Yeah. But the idea of rebirth, no, that is an insight into the nature of reality. It's the opposite of a cultural thing. Yeah. And so when people say that rebirth is a cultural thing, actually they got it completely the wrong way around. Yeah. This is the, um, the answer to those people who call themselves secular Buddhists. Uh, this is the answer that actually, you know, uh, secular Buddhism itself is often just a cultural phenomenon of the modern world uh, and misses out so much of what Buddhism really is about. Uh. So you can't take anything out. Yeah, that's so a right view. Yeah, it's fundamental to this path. Uh. Samma Samadhi, right uh, stillness, is fundamental to the Buddhist path, yeah? Anything you try to take out, and basically you're destroying the path of the, the Dhamma. So not, nothing in there is superfluous, nor is anything missing. Nothing is missing in the suttas. You have a full path to awakening in the suttas. You don't need the Abhidhamma. Isn't that good news? Abhidhamma not required, yeah? <laughs> I'm not saying the Abhidhamma is evil. Maybe sometimes something good can come out of it, but you don't actually need it. Yeah, it is kind of complete in its own right. And you don't really need my explanations either. Yeah? Or sometimes I may tell you nonsense. Yeah? So you know, be aware of that as well. Eh? Usually the latest explanation of the suttas is usually the worst one. Eh? <laughs> so this is the very latest explanation of here and now. <laughs> the very worst one. <laughs> it's true. Right? If you look at the, the history of, uh, of Buddhism, yeah? first of all, you have the Dhamma, uh, Buddha, then you kind of get the other. But Dhamma may be OK. Then you have the commentaries a bit more dodgy. Then you have the super commentaries a bit more dodgy again. Eh? Then you have the latest commentary, that's kind of the most dodgy of all. Uh, and it kind of goes in a hierarchy like that. And there's a, some truth to that. Uh, it is not entirely wrong. And the reason why is because the Dhamma is gradually disappearing. Uh, yeah, gradually it's fading away. Uh, and this is one of the things that gives rise to a sense of urgency on the path. The understanding of the corruption of the Dhamma. The false gold is arising, the real gold is disappearing. Uh, that is kind of what, uh, as it says in one of the suttas. So teaching is well explained. Uh, yeah? You don't really need anything apart from this. Uh, but of course, we also need to understand that uh, the Dhamma has been around for two and a half thousand years. Uh, and because it has been around for so long, yes, occasionally there will be distortions in the teachings. So you also have to be on the lookout for that as well. That complicates matters a little bit. Uh, generally speaking, the Pali Suttas are really, really, really good. Uh, occasionally, there may be slight uh, things that are not quite right. Uh, but generally speaking, if you read them, you will be 
uh, you will be fine. So, um, yes. Okay. So let's see. So this is well explained by the Buddha. Yeah? Uh, apparent in the present life. Uh, sandittiko. Uh, so, uh, or visible in the present life. It means that you don't have to die. Yeah? You get the results now. You get to see what the Dhamma is. And this is true of the deepest aspects of the Dhamma, but it's also true of the shallower aspects of the Dhamma as well. Yeah, you can recall your, your past lives in the present life. You can become an arahant in the present life. Uh, but you can also enjoy the Dhamma in a sense of you close your eyes, you meditate, and you feel a bit of peace. You can do, do an act of generosity, and you can feel the spiritual happiness that comes from being generous. And you can feel that now, yeah, straight away if you do it. Right now, right in this moment, if you turn the mind in the right way, you can experience a bit of metta and compassion for other people. Yeah, straight away you can do this. So in that sense, the Dhamma is available at all times uh, if you practice it in the right way. Yeah. There is a nice uh, sutta. I, usually talk, I haven't really brought the sutta in on this retreat, but it's kind of a, it's a nice sutta that gives, uh, shows you in what sense the Dhamma is sanditiko, yeah, is present in this particular life. Uh, that is the sutta which I taught often with a monk Samidhi. And those of you who know the monk Samidhi, uh, the monk Samidhi, he has just kind of had a bath and he's kind of drying himself and putting on his robes. And then this Devata comes. Uh, and uh, this Devata, probably a female deity, that's kind of the idea. It sets up a kind of tension, the young monk and then the female deity, uh, probably a very beautiful deity. Uh, and this, you can see the kind of the idea there. Uh, and then, so this female deity comes to this young monk, yeah? And what does she say? This is kind of really Mara's daughter, right? <laughs> she comes to this young monk and says, why are you wearing these robes? Yeah? Why are you wandering around with an arms ball? Yeah? You are young. You should enjoy sensual pleasures. Yeah? <laughs> this is kind of Mara plus. You know? It's kind of really Max, Max Mara. There is a... <laughs> Max Mara. And so... And, uh, and then, uh, you know, he says, well, what are you talking about? Well, what I'm saying is that, you know, the sensual pleasures are available right now. All you have to do is kind of go out, find yourself a wife, and enjoy the sensual pleasures of the world. But the Dhamma, yeah, that's far away in the future. Nibbana, way down the track, Samadhi. You don't know when these things will come, yeah. So get what is visible here and now. Don't go for this future stuff, for Nibbana or whatever, yeah. And somebody, oh, maybe you have a point. And somebody thinks, yeah, this is how kind of people disrobe. Yeah, oh, maybe you're right about this nibbana. When is it going to happen? Yeah. And then, but then he kind of gets his senses back and he says to this date, no, actually, it's the other way around, he says. Yeah. It is the sensual pleasures of the world. They are the ones who are always in the future, whereas the Dhamma is visible here and now. So he turns it upside down. And it's one of these beautiful paradoxes of Buddhism, yeah? Because on the surface of it, it sounds like the Devata is right. Sensual pleasures are right here. Ha! Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah? Proof, proof, they're right here. They're visible here and now. <laughs> no doubt about it. <laughs> and, so, and so it seems, like, it's true. I remember I gave a talk. This was in, um, you know, uh, in Kalimatan, you know, Bal Balikpapan. You know Balikpapan? Yeah, this is this town on the southern southern side of uh, Borneo? Yeah, the Balikpapan means under the plank or something. Yeah, it's kind of a very kind of interesting name. So I was giving anyway. I was giving a talk. I never forget the town because of the name of the town. It's kind of interesting name. I was giving a talk. There. I was with the Ehipasiko Foundation. It's a very large Buddhist group in Indonesia, and they always take you on this tour to all the cities, and it's very exhausting, but it's also quite nice. And uh, and so I was sitting there and I was telling the story of Samidhi and the Devata. And there was this young man on the, foot, on the front bench. And I was saying to this young man, well, who do you think is right, the Devata or the monk? And he said, yeah, the Devata is right. <laughs> That's what he said. Yeah. Sensual pleasures are available here and now. It was very funny. Everyone laughed when they said that. So I was very, he, he was obviously messing around a bit. Uh, but so it is one of those paradoxes, yeah, who is actually right and why? I mean, I think we all understand that the monk is obviously right, the devata had it wrong, yeah. but why is that? Uh, and the answer is, and it comes from some of those things that we are talking about before, about craving, about the dog and the bone, yeah, always running, always running, never finding satisfaction. Craving is always about the future. You never get there. 
there is no end point. You never find that satisfaction. And so it's always in the future. It never is the present moment with craving. And so that's the problem with craving. Whereas the Dhamma, when you practice it in the right way, when you are kind, when you are generous, when the Samadhi starts to work, that kind of happiness is a present kind of happiness. It is a happiness that has nothing to do with craving. Yeah? And that's why it is here and now. That is how you resolve that apparent paradox. Actually, it isn't the paradox after all, once you understand it. So don't go for those sensual pleasures, yeah? or enjoy them in a reasonable way. But that is not what life is about. That is not where you find real satisfaction. So the Dhamma is apparent in the present life. You can feel it right now, but also all the results of the path are available in this life. You don't have to wait till after you die. And uh, all most religions are like that. You have to wait till after you die. Yeah, and if it turns out that uh, you know it was wrong, yeah, maybe the God, maybe there was no God. Yeah, maybe the God was an evil God. What if God is evil? What do you do then? You kind of pray and then you go, you die, and you find actually, yeah, it was no good. Or that's kind of scary, isn't it? And then it's too late because you're dead already. So it's much better to have a religious teaching where actually everything is available here and now. We don't know, yeah? If you read the Old Testament a little bit and some of the things that the God did there, you have good grounds for wondering if this God is quite. Uh, you sh should really trust this God, yeah? There's some weird stuff going on in the Old Testament. Uh, and the God smiting and God is jealous and God is kind of asks you to do all kind of crazy things. Uh, is it, I think we should have good senses to be a little bit doubtful about that kind of God. Uh, and uh, that's what I say anyway. But I'm pretty kind of... Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty heret <laughs> yeah, heretical. So uh, we just... Uh, so this is what, some of the things that makes the Dhamma very special in so many ways. So, so uh, I don't mean to be uh, hard on Christian people. Lots of really nice Christian people out there. But some of the teachings, some of the doctrines of Christianity, I find it very hard to accept. So, anyway, let us move on. It is immediately effective. Yeah, This is just another uh, version of apparent in the present life. Uh, immediately effective is akaliko. Akalika, not to do with time. And usually when we say not to do with time, it means that it is apparent in this life again. This is kind of the idea of immediately effective. It means the same thing as the previous one. Then we have the idea of inviting inspection. This is ehipasiko. Yeah. Come and see for yourself. Check it out. Test it. Yeah. Don't just believe blindly, but Find out whether it works. It's nice to have faith, but don't just have faith just blindly, you know. Uh, and if, if things work, then good, carry on with it. And if it doesn't work, okay, then maybe you should uh, have some uh, um, doubts or whatever, and then you can ask about things. Uh, one of the nice things about the Dhamma that I always found so powerful is that it is okay to have doubts. Yeah, you're allowed to have doubts. If something is doubtful, in fact, you should have doubts. Not to have doubts if something is doubtful, that is kind of the bad thing. And again, this is what something that makes the Dhamma quite unique in the world, makes it very different from uh, many other teachings that we find in the world. So you're allowed to inspect, check it out for yourself. Does it make sense or not? And uh, ehi pasiko. Ehi means come. Pasiko, pasa means to see. Come and see ish is the kind of literal meaning of this. I'm glad it doesn't translate as come and see, though, because it's a bit, a bit funny here. Relevant. This is uh, opanayiko. Vikibodi translates it as, as applicable. Yeah, opanayika, something which uh, uh, nayaka is something that leads, that goes somewhere. Yeah, upa, so it leads kind of onwards or it leads on or something like that. It is something that you can apply, and when you apply it, it has consequences, it works. Relevant. I'm not entirely sure if I understand exactly why it translates as relevant. Uh, relevant. Uh, I guess it means something like it works or something else, maybe. Uh, not sure. Uh, but the idea of something that actually has an effect and it works and it brings you forward. Nayaka. Nayaka is a leader in Buddhism. The Mahanayaka is the great leaders of the Buddhist sects in Sri Lanka, for example. Uh, the same word, same root of the word. Uh, so something that is to be applied or something. Yeah. 
open eye ko, yes. Great. Taking in. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Take. Ah. Okay. Leading. Leading inward. I think that is why. Now I understand. There was a translation many years ago. Someone had leading inward. Maybe taken from the Thai translation. But then it was uh, criticized by somebody saying this is not appropriate. Not right in English. They were saying. I think. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's go on. So, uh, next, the last part, so that sensible people can know it for themselves. Uh, yeah, so, you know, bin you, uh, how does it go again, uh, the Pali? Pachatang bin you hi vedita boha. Yeah, okay, so, yeah, bin you pachatang vedita boha. Yeah, so, pachatang means internally or for oneself. And bin you is like a wise person. Uh, yeah, uh, so a wise person uh, and vedita to be known. Uh, to be known by a wise, wise person for themselves. Uh, so you have to be wise, you have to be sensible to be able to um, kind of get the Dhamma. And uh, so it's good. So this is kind of a bar to clear already. And this is why some people never come close to Dhamma because they don't have enough sense. Uh, yeah, this is kind of a problem. I, one of the things I always find so strange in the world is that there are so many people in the world who are really intelligent. Uh, but they use their intelligence on all kinds of stupid things. Uh, yeah? You have people like you know, so certain uh, prime ministers or certain leaders of countries around the world, often very bright and very sharp people. You know? uh, and they use their brightness and intelligence and all the worldly things, how to make the world a better place, uh, instead of asking the really profound questions. Uh, yeah? What about some of the people, some of the scientists? Okay, scientists is not so bad, yeah? but some of them are really, really, really bright and sharp. Uh, or maybe some of the business people, I don't know, someone like Elon Musk, maybe he must be pretty intelligent, I assume, otherwise he probably wouldn't succeed the way he does. But why do they always put that intelligence towards worldly things? Why don't they apply to things that really matter, really, really matter, like spiritual things, like the meaning of life? Yeah? And so it shows you that often there is a gap between being wise and being intelligent. You can be really intelligent, knowing how to deal with the worldly things uh, up to a certain point, uh, but you don't really ultimately apply it to those things that really are important in life, that deal with the meaning of life itself. Uh, and uh, so this is like one level up again. Yeah? And uh, so that's, uh, and I, you know, sometimes we find this very smart people. I remember people like Tony Blair, who was the Prime Minister of England for a long, long time, and no doubt very bright, very intelligent, no doubt, uh, but he never really questioned his faith. Faith. Yeah, he was always a Christian, uh, and he was happy to be a Christian. Uh, and he kind of stayed with that, and he kind of didn't really want to, to ask, to, uh, you know, to, to investigate into that. Uh, I remember I had one long, long time ago, I had a girlfriend, believe it or not. So, but I, 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 <laughs> and and this, this girlfriend, she had a father. Her father was a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. He was one of those really brilliant people, a double PhD, PhD in economics and PhD in, uh, in um, statistics, I think. Yeah. And this was a time, these days, everyone has a double PhD, right? It's kind of, but in those days, very few people had double PhDs because uh, all the inflation in, the, in the education yeah, is kind of, and he was one of these really incredibly brilliant people. They were talking about maybe the Nobel Prize and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and he never got it. And he's still alive, actually. I think he's over 90 years old now. Huh? And uh, he was one of these people. Yeah, what about your religion? What about Christianity? Yeah, should, don't you investigate that? His daughter asked him that. Uh, and he said, no, that's too complicated. Huh? <laughs> right? Isn't that amazing? Huh? I find it so kind of remarkable that some of these really, really brilliant people, they are, why? They are intelligent. Uh, but there's something in them that stops them from kind of investigating some of these very, very profound aspects of life. Uh, has to do with meaning, has to do with real purpose. Uh, and so I think it, is, it takes, maybe it takes a bit of courage. I don't know what it is. Uh, it takes something to want to investigate the most profound and deepest things in our life. Uh, it is not just a crutch, yeah, religion. Religion is much more than that. Religion is... Uh, uh, the possibility of developing something truly interesting and profound. That is what it should really be about. Uh, so it's not really religion. It's more like spirituality. I prefer to think about it in that way. Uh, that makes it more, uh, uh, more profound in a sense. Uh, 
Religion is often perhaps more like a crutch, whereas spirituality is an active development of the mind and a development of the person. So this is the uh, idea of sensible people can know it for themselves. Yeah. Uh, so you have to be careful. You have to take the opportunity while you are still sensible. In your next life, you may be insensible, uh, and then you have a problem. Uh. Then when a noble disciple recollects the teaching, the mind is not full of desire, ill will, and confusion. Yeah? At that time, your mind is straight, based on the Dhamma. And because you are straight, based on the Dhamma, you experience the, uh, the inspiration in the meaning and the inspiration in the Dhamma. And then you feel joy connected with the Dhamma. And because of that, you go all through all the stages and eventually read Samadhi. This is called the noble disciple who lives in balance among people who are unbalanced, who lives untroubled among people who are troubled. They've entered the stream of the teaching and developed the recollection of the teaching. Yeah. So let's do some more meditation. Um, I have a question about um, this topic of karma. Uh -huh. So do you think there's such a thing as um, self-perpetuating karmic retribution? Something like passive vipaka. So let's say if someone were to sound very intelligent yeah. and to invent like weapons of mass destruction yeah. with the intention of uh, with very unwholesome intentions yeah. and, uh, and it, it is successfully deployed and adopted and it has caused massive suffering. So after even the death of, let's say, this being who did such invention, um, will they continue? Because his inventions that he created with unwholesome intentions continue to reap, uh, sorry, continue to cause a lot of suffering. Yeah. So in this person's uh, future rebirth, yeah. will he, in a way, continue receiving the dividends, like the, <laughs> the of his karma? Yeah, 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 exactly. That he has, yeah. cost, he, has, he has created in this present life. So it's almost like perpetual. And when will it be fully exhausted? Oh, it's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's an interesting question. I've never heard that one before. I've heard most questions before, but never heard this one before. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I would say no. I would say because the intention at the beginning is to create that weapon. And uh, you know, when the, the deployment of that weapon, other people will reap the karma for deploying the weapon, and he will reap the karma for creating it. And the creation only happens once. And so, uh, you know, so it's just, I think it's two different kind of commas there. One is the deployment and one is the creation. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn. Yeah. Just wondering because yeah. similarly with, let's say, wholesome ideologies, right? Yeah. Uh, like the Buddha, for example, he uh, taught the, the Dharma to, um, and, and it will last throughout this Buddha sasana. Yeah. So, of course, because the, the Buddha it has attained Parinibbana, so yeah. he, he's like unconditioned, he, he has attained the deathless. But um, let's say teachers who have come up with um, very wholesome yeah. ideologies. And yeah. Because let's say if they were to be reborn in the deva realms, right, um, even the formless realms, then uh, would they in, in a way still, um, let's say they recall the yeah. wholesome mm. ideology that they have taught mm. and it has yeah. brought joy to yeah. many people's yeah. lives. Yeah. So yeah. that itself um, yeah. arouses yeah. wholesome yeah. mental states. So yeah. the, the yeah. karma... Yeah. Sure, absolutely. No, so I, I think you're right in that it kind of it has a very, very powerful karma, right? Uh, so if you create uh, a weapon of mass destruction, then it will actually it will last for a very long time. But it's only I think it's only one one kind of it's, it's the creation itself, which is the karma. But because you can bring that to mind again and again, and and as you say, you can be reminded to see other people using it. Uh, yeah. That that karma will come come back to you. Uh, but I still think it is the initial thing that actually is the karma because that's what you do. But then it carries on for a long, long, long time into the future. And those people who deploy it, well, they will, they will obviously also kind of uh, receive the karma of the deployment of those mass destruction, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, so, uh, and the same thing, as you say, with the good karma, if you do something really good, like, you know, teaching the Dhamma or whatever, and you can see other people in the future enjoying that, uh, that's wonderful. Yeah. If you, you know, it's kind of, you can imagine you'd be, feel really joyful to see that it, it carries on into the future. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think you, I think you're onto something. Yeah. I think that's a, it's a good point you're making. Yeah. But uh, I don't know if it is a kind of karma itself, but it's, I think it's just the initial karma that is incredibly powerful. I think that's what's, what's going on there. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ajahn. Yeah. Ajahn, <clears throat> I have a question. 
Um, okay, it's related to let's say if you're working in a lab, yeah, and uh, it's for the good of human beings. Okay, you're discovering drugs or <clears throat> something that will help in uh, eradicating certain illnesses like cancer. Yeah. But in the process, actually, you're testing on certain animals like mm. mice, whatever. Mm. What what is the what are your comments about that? In yeah, terms of the yeah. This is a this is very kind of. Uh, Complicated. And I think the, the thing is that, you know, sometimes when we think about kamma, we think of kamma as either black or white. Uh, very often there are all shades of gray when it comes to kamma, you know. So in that kind of situation, your, your main motivation is probably to do something wholesome. You want to do something well. Uh, but if within, with kind of as part of that, you're doing things that are also destructive of life. Uh, there's two ways of looking at it. Either you can say that there's one overall kamma, which is the kamma, the good kamma you get from creating something positive, uh, and then there's a bad karma you get from, from killing those animals as part of the process. Uh. So it's like two separate karmas in a sense, uh, yeah? And uh, so one is bad and one is good, uh, and so then they, they will kind of add up. So the question is, what, how does it add up? Uh, in, that case, uh, in that case, what is the addition? Well, you, you have to do the, do the sums. I'm not sure how to do those sums, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, uh, but quite possibly, in that case, it will depend on how many animals you kill. It will depend on uh, how much good intention you put into making the drug. Yeah, I mean, how, wow, this is really great. I can help so many people. Or whether you're kind of just doing it as a job. But yeah, so it will depend on a large number of factors to decide how that karma actually works out. Uh, but it is conceivable in that case that the good karma overrides the bad karma if you have really good intentions in terms of the drugs and you kind of regret regretfully killing animals you don't really want to, but you have no choice. Whereas another person who kind of does, does it for a job but doesn't really have very good intentions and doesn't you know, and quite happy to kill animals, then the negative karma may be stronger. So I would say it depends on, uh, you know, on, uh, on the circumstances, which one is most important. Uh, but I think also as a general thing is that kamma is often not just black or white. We tend to think of kamma is a good kamma or bad kamma. Very often it's kind of gray because our intentions are not either completely evil or completely good. Our intentions are often somewhere in between. Yeah, there's kind of, okay, the mind is a bit muddled. You don't really know what you're doing. There's a little bit of greed and a little bit of kindness and kind of all of these things. So kamma is often a bit more gray, I would say, than actually pure. Uh, in you know purely dark or purely purely bright uh, yeah hey Ajahn, just just yeah. i would say because you said it with such passion just now like why intelligent people don't you know they can't tell the difference yeah. but actually to them i mean just saying out of like for me also, before I meditated and can watch the mind, I don't know that the Dhamma was 2D to me. You know, like I always say that after yeah. I meditated and I have my own little little insights, that's when I become 3D yeah. and the faith grew and then yeah. I start to see Buddha in a different light. Yeah. But still concepts like rebirth and all that, it's like they will say to, to normal people, yeah. It's also a belief because it's what Buddha experienced. It's not something we can experience by ourselves. So to them, they, they can't yeah. tell the difference between what Jesus says is true or what Buddha said to them is just you know, the same yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think what I was, yeah, you have a good point. And, and for most people, you just live in the world. The world is what you see. That's what's obvious. Mm -hmm. And so you do what's obvious around you. And these other things are, you know, too far away from you. But I think what I was more referring to was more the idea that very intelligent people, they just take things on board on faith rather than actually questioning it. Uh, mm -hmm. And they take things like, you know, I just believe in God and it's too difficult to, to question it and I don't, we don't want to question it. Uh, and that is kind of where I find, find myself, you know, why don't you use that intelligence on the, the spiritual path? Because this is clearly, this is really, really significant. Uh, this is about, you know, what happens after you die, what, what kind of, uh, uh, in, this is about the broader vision of reality. Uh, and so this is where I find it problematic uh, and I, I I think we, you know, the, our first and foremost uh, obligation to ourselves and others is to think about the really profound aspects of life and do something with that. Uh, yeah. I think they don't realize that it's an assumption. But then again, to be fair, before yeah. we are an arahant, it is also an assumption until we realize it for ourselves, right? Sometimes yeah. when I have little doubt, that, yeah. that's where the doubt still arise sometimes. Yeah. 
it's still yeah. an assumption until you have the real insight yourself. It, it is, uh, but uh, it's good to question anyway. We should always question. If you don't question, then that's kind of where the stupidity usually starts. Uh, and some of these people don't question, and that's what I, I find questionable. They don't question. <laughs> <laughs>